this is um, joint work. It's part of the PhD thesis of a former student of mine who graduated about uh, a year ago, uh, Bo Yufan, who did a number of things with me uh, related to um, instabilities of uh, internal wave beams. And uh, this part of the work, and it uh, actually is a somewhat new approach to the stability of uh, internal wave beams I would like to share with you. Okay, so uh, let's start with a little background here, which uh, probably not necessary for this audience, but uh, of course, uh, this for gravity waves, I'm not including rotation uh, in this slide, uh, but rotation will be included in the, in the analysis. So the important uh, thing here is, of course, is the anisotropy of uh, internal waves and the fact that the uh, wave frequency omega is, uh, depends only on the angle of inclination of the wave vector to the vertical in this way. And therefore, the group velocity is orthogonal to the phase velocity. And this leads to this classical uh, uh, wave configuration where you shake a, a, a cylinder, let's say, here up and down the cylinder extending perpendicularly to the screen. Uh, instead of circular wave fronts, uh, you generate these four beams whose uh, inclination is uh, uh, related, of course, to the driving frequency, which has to be less than the uh, brand Vassala frequency here, the buoyancy frequency n. And this was noted long time ago in this old paper, 1967. Um, and now it's realized that these actually, these internal wave beams in the idealized situation of inviscid uh, uniform stratified Boussinesque fluid, in fact, are uh, nonlinear states uh, in assuming their normal uh, 3D variations, of course. So there's a very nice, uh, very nice uh, fundamental uh, waves. Now, these also are of some uh, physical significance uh, because um, it, this is kind of uh, clear from this uh, numerical simulation by uh, Kevin Lamb who looked at the oscillatory flow over a big bump here. And um, this is meant to be a model of the tidal conversion problem where the, the oscillatory current um, is inducing an internal tide. And uh, as you can see, the internal tide uh, consists of beams close to the topography. It starts as beams. And eventually these beams, of course, go into modes, but at least close by here, uh, we do have beams and they interact and they do all kinds of uh, nice things. Uh, this also is uh, uh, supported by field observations where you see a beam here uh, close to a slope, a disturbance which has beam-like structure, uh, you can see here. So, um, these beams are also an important part in the interaction of the barotropic tide with the sea, uh, with the topography, the tidal conversion problem. Now, the motivation for this work is uh, has to do with the uh, scenario in which instabilities of internal waves, uh, which have to do with the internal tide, of course. Uh, may play a role in the dissipation of the internal tide because the transfer of energy to shorter scales, which are more uh, prone to uh, uh, dissipation, is an important process. So you would like to know uh, what instabilities are possible, and in particular, short scale instabilities that can enhance uh, this dissipation process. So using this as motivation, uh, way back, uh, there was uh, there's a, a rich li a rich literature on instabilities for periodic waves. Uh, that is, waves which are plane waves of uh, infinite extent, and uh, these, of course, are a, um, 
finite amplitude states as well, because they're special case of beams. Uh, and uh, the way to study the stability of a periodic uh, basic flow, in the natural ways, uh, what's called uh, Floquet stability analysis. And uh, this was done actually uh, by Mead, first done in the early 70s, I believe, and then by many others, including uh, also three-dimensional disturbances was done in a very comprehensive way. And one uh, message that comes out of this, uh, which is uh, quite interesting, is that in the small amplitude limit, that is when the underlying periodic wave has small amplitude, then the disturbances, the unstable disturbances and the instability mechanism can be understood in terms of resonant triad interaction, what I call TRI, which we may also write a triadic resonance instability, uh, same thing, same acronym. And this involves uh, two disturbances of frequencies omega one and omega two adding up to the frequency of the underlying wave and with wave vectors K1 plus K2 adding up to the wave vector of the underlying wave. Uh, this comes from the Floquet stability uh, very nicely. Um, now, a special case of this uh, TRI is the so-called PSI, the parametric subharmonic instability. And this one, uh, this uh, triad conditions are um, satisfied by disturbances of uh, very short scale, so very large wave numbers uh, or wave vector magnitudes, which are almost equal and opposite. So they almost cancel and they form this, they can satisfy this wave vector condition. Uh, and the frequency is then almost uh, one half of the underlying frequency. So this uh, has received a lot of attention uh, also because it's very short scale, as you can see the wave vectors here are magnitude much, uh, uh, oh, uh, this must be the other way, much bigger than K0, I'm uh, sorry. <laughs> it has to be the other way around. Uh, it's a typo, it's a very important typo here, sorry, it has to be the other way. Um, and uh, therefore, uh, they're relevant to this, uh, possibly relevant to this dissipation process. Um, for uh, wave beams, uh, this type of uh, Floquet stability analysis is more difficult uh, because you're dealing with systems of differential equations than algebraic systems. And only recently in 2019, we have a paper by Onuki and Tanaka that made uh, an attempt to study the stability of wave beams using uh, Floquet, uh, Floquet stability, okay? Now, um, in parallel with this uh, Floquet analysis, uh, there were two simplified models that were proposed by a former student of mine, uh, Hussein Karimi and myself in 2014, 2017, which uh, assumed a, a subharmonic wave package with these frequencies plus or minus omega two, or omega over two suggested by the uh, PSI. And uh, the underlying uh, beam has amplitude order epsilon and frequency omega. So you satisfy this uh, resonance condition for the frequencies in this way. And uh, this, uh, these simplified models, uh, which assume, make this assumption, uh, reach uh, the following important conclusions. Uh, well, first of all, they bring out a very interesting uh, aspect of the beams, which is not present for uh, periodic waves, namely the role of the group velocity, because the beam has finite width, uh, the disturbances have to stay long enough in contact with the underlying beam to cause instability. That's not an issue, of course, with periodic wave, which has infinite width. So uh, in some sense, of course, this makes the beams less unstable or less prone to this type of instability than the periodic waves. And this was also brought out by these models which bring out the significance of the group velocity. And the bottom line of the, the first work in 2014, this was in the absence of rotation. It turns out that only uh, beams with a nearly monochromatic profile. So they, they're of finite width, but they involve many oscillations in there. Uh, so they're not exactly periodic, but uh, 
they're uh, close to periodic, but of finite extent. Uh, this can develop PSI, but otherwise no PSI is possible. And the other interesting case is the near inertial PSI, where you can have instability for general uh, profile. This, of course, is when the beam has frequency twice the Coriolis, so the subharmonics is close to the critical frequency, the cutoff frequency. And the reason this happens is because these disturbances then uh, have, have wave, uh, group velocity which is close to zero. So in this case, they can stay long enough in contact with the beam and cause the instability. So that's an intuitive explanation of these models, which uh, give rise to some interesting uh, new eigenvalue problems where you can make very specific predictions for growth rates and uh, uh, mode shapes and so on. Uh, in parallel with this, I want to mention that the Floquet analysis of uh, Nuki and Tanaka is purely computational, of course, and the focus of that was on uh, uh, basically steep beams. Uh, that is, the epsilon is order one here, or, uh, and uh, they look at 2D and 3D instabilities, but the emphasis on steep beams, and therefore not directly re relevant to PSI. You could do the computations for a, a smaller epsilon, but this is not in the original work. So uh, this sets the stage for uh, this uh, new approach I mentioned, which is the, the topic for, uh, for the present uh, talk, uh, which, uh, here is the objectives. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to go back to the Floquet eigenvalue problem for a finite width uh, beam. And we're going to look at an asymptotic analysis in the limit relevant to PSI. And what is that limit? That limit is a joint uh, situation where the underlying beam has small amplitude, so absolutely much less than one, we're looking at disturbances which are very short scale. So the K, uh, the wave number, much bigger than one for the disturbance. And furthermore, the Reynolds number is very high so that the inverse Reynolds number is uh, much less than one. And the first uh, goal, which was the original goal of uh, this analysis was to compare to the approximate uh, PSI models um, so this was the first thing. Now, it turns out that as we did this asymptotic analysis, something else uh, that we achieved this comparison, and I'm going to talk about it uh, later, but we also were able to explain theoretically and what we believe in a nice way, something that was observed numerically both by Onuki and Tanaka and also earlier that really uh, this limit, the joint limit, where the wave number of the disturbance increases, so the disturbance becomes shorter uh, for a small amplitude uh, basic state, is actually a little non-uniform in the following sense, that the disturbance spectrum, that is the Floquet mode spectrum, broadens. So the PSI is no longer valid when the disturbance becomes shorter and shorter for fixed epsilon. So uh, PSI may not be the relevant mechanism for very short scale, scale disturbances. This was, there was some uh, uh, numerical evidence about that, uh, which was attributed to the advection of the disturbance by the underlying, uh, by the underlying wave, which uh, becomes more important as case increased. Uh, now, our asymptotic analysis works out very, very nicely in this case, and it reveals that indeed, uh, this is a new mechanism, short scale instability, which is distinct from PSI and features broadband spectrum. And moreover, in the case of beams, uh, this mechanism uh, is valid in situations where PSI is not uh, appropriate. For example, I mentioned earlier, when there's no rotation, the uh, beams of finite width, uh, not nearly monochromatic, are not susceptible to PSI. Yet, as you're going to see, they, they are susceptible and they can suffer this very short scale instability with a broadband spectrum. So this is a new instability that comes from the asymptotic analysis. So basically this is the uh, 
this is the broader view before I get into the details, okay? So this is what we're gonna talk about. Now let's, um, let's see what we're going to do. So, okay, so here is a little uh, schematic of what is going on. Here is the beam is uh, this finite width uh, beam uh, between the dotted lines um, of certain frequency, which is related also to the angle theta uh, through the dispersion relation here, the inclination angle theta. And there's of course rotation here with the Coriolis parameter. Uh, the coordinates, we have an along beam coordinate C and an across beam coordinate eta, which is perpendicular to C, of course. And uh, here's gravity and the wave vector for the disturbances is this K. I'm going to come back uh, to it later. But now um, this beam, uh, we want to study by Floquet analysis. What does this mean? Well, here schematically, let's say this is the along beam, uh, the along beam uh, velocity uh, component. This is split into the basic flow here, which is the beam. It has a profile you see u of eta depends only on the cross beam coordinate with a e to the minus i omega t plus complex conjugate. So this is the basic beam, and we superpose to it an infinitesimal perturbation. Now, the form of the perturbation is dictated, of course, by the stability, by the Floquet analysis. And what does it involve? Well, we can first separate out the C dependency in the usual way, because there's no dependency of the basic state on C, on the along beam coordinate. Okay, so that's straightforward. Um, also, um, the rest, is Floquet analysis, which says that the disturbance can be taken in the form e to the lambda t, where lambda is a eigenvalue, but not a constant here. This has to be a periodic function with the same uh, period as the underlying wave. So it involves all the harmonics here, as you can see, uh, in principle, all the harmonics in principle. Um, the results I'm going to show now as motivation for the asymptotic analysis. The asymptotic analysis is, is uh, a little delicate as you are going to see. You have to make the right substitutions and this is motivated by the numerical results I'm going to show you. The numerical results are obtained in the same way as Onuki and Tanaka, more or less. Uh, that is, you use this monodromy approach of solving the Floquet eigenvalue problem, which is very, uh, very nice here and it works. It's, it's a very nice uh, approach. I'm not going to talk about it in detail here. So we're going to assume a Gaussian beam profile. So this U of eta is essentially a Gaussian. And we're going to assume epsilon, the amplitude of the beam is uh, 0.01, the frequency dimension is 0.1. And these are inviscid results. So nu is equal to zero. So here is, uh, here is some result. This is lifted off the paper. So let me walk you through so you see what happens. Here we're plotting the real part of the eigenvalue. So that's the growth rate as a function of mu. Mu is the stream, the, uh, the wave number in the along beam direction. And as you can see, there's instability. And this is uh, exactly at the there's rotation and this exactly at uh, omega equal to f, all right? So we have instability that uh, bifurcates here as mu increases. And then as mu becomes large, which of course is the short scale disturbances, it asymptotes here up to, uh, um, to a certain constant here for the growth rate. However, if you look at the power spectral density, uh, we are showing it here, here and here, it's very different. At the beginning, we have the two frequencies, uh, minus one half and plus one half. Um, these are the perturbation frequencies uh, normalized with the basic frequency. So this is PSI here. Well, when mu is about nine or whatever it is here, 8.5, actually we can see the three halves and the minus three halves coming out. And then finally here, it starts becoming broadband in the sense that the minus one half and the plus one half no longer dominate, but it's the three halves and so on. So it's becoming, uh, it's becoming broader. Uh, the growth rate is not really affected 
but the spectrum becomes uh, broader. So strictly speaking, this is not ESR. Um, if you look at the mode shapes for the various uh, components, the frequency components, uh, here is the plus one half, this is a minus one half, and you can see they look like wave packets, uh, wave packets, short scale wave packets with a, uh, uh, with a wave number, which is uh, pretty high here. And this for the minus three halves and uh, uh, plus three halves, again, uh, smaller wave packets, this for this case. And then for the next case, uh, for this one, uh, actually this is for this case, and uh, for the next one is this one. Again, you, we have, of course, the mu is larger, so we have even shorter wave packets, and uh, the uh, corresponding uh, wave numbers, of course, have increased, the carrier wave numbers have increased. So the, the numerical simulations are leading, are making suggestions towards the asymptotic analysis, and they tell us that uh, the Fourier, the Floquet mode consists of wave packets of various frequencies, uh, plus or minus one half, plus or minus three halves, plus or minus five halves, and so on, omega. And uh, we have to take that into consideration when setting up the Floquet analysis. So uh, this is the asymptotic analysis then. Uh, we work with the, uh, this is 2D, so we work with the stream function, the density, and the, uh, uh, the, uh, the cross velocity, the velocity in the transverse direction, because there is rotation. And let's say for the uh, stream function, this is the basic state, this is the beam. Uh, and the same thing, of course, the, the basic state involves a velocity, of course, and a density. The key substitution, which is um, motivated by the results I showed you earlier, is that the coefficients of the Fourier uh, mode in the Floquet mode, uh, uh, here the nth one, involve envelopes, an, wn, rn, times a carrier here, where this gamma is, is a, wave, uh, is a uh, wave number in the cross beam direction, so this is the uh, along the beam, and this is the cross beam direction. And K uh, here is the wave number magnitude. If we go backwards uh, here, uh, this is the wave number vector here for the disturbance. And it has an along beam component, which is mu, and a, a cross beam component, which is gamma. So uh, this is reflected here. And this chi is nothing more than the inclination of the wave vector to the cross beam direction, okay? So uh, we write it as uh, envelopes times this carrier, and uh, this is suggested by the numerics, and you will see that how nicely it works and chi this inclination of the carrier wave vector to the eta direction. Now, this you substitute the equation of motion, and it is a mess, but you're gonna make uh, order out of the mess. So here I listed off, um, the paper, and uh, you can see you get a system, of course, infinite system for these uh, <laughs> envelopes. You may say, well, is this progress? Well, you will see. Um, so this is the equation for the stream function. So you can see here the stream function and so on. This comes from the, um, uh, the momentum equation in the transverse direction, and this comes from the density equation. Now, Remember, k is large here and epsilon is small. And the important thing I want to note is of course, there are some coupling terms. For example, in this equation, the nth envelope is coupled to the n plus one and the n minus one through the underlying wave, the q, and uh, this comes from the beam, and similarly here and so on. But the important thing I want to draw your attention to is that this coupling involves not epsilon, but epsilon times k. So this is really the coupling coefficient. Epsilon is the amplitude of the beam in case the wave number of the perturbation. If the wave number perturbation becomes large, uh, then epsilon k may not be small anymore. So the coupling may be strong. So this is the important thing here. You have epsilon, and this is of course the viscous term. And you can see this epsilon k appearing. So the first conclusion we come out of this is that the coupling terms with the underlying beam 
are order epsilon k. So in the PSI limit where epsilon is small and k is large, this coupling is weak and therefore PSI is relevant. So only two frequencies uh, dominate the plus or minus omega two, only if epsilon k is much less than one. Then um, under this assumption, the n equals zero, which is omega over two and the n equals one, which corresponds uh, minus uh, omega over two, a component dominate in this messy, uh, in this messy system here and the system, the eigenvalue problem can be solved iteratively. However, there is a catch here. There is a catch which comes out of this is that the smaller uh, components, even under this assumption, the epsilon k much less than one, n equals minus one, three omega over two, and n equals two, three, minus three omega over two components, which actually we ignored in the original uh, simplified models with Karimi, also contribute to the dominant balance. So they have to be taken into account. Uh, this is something which is very hard to imagine because these are smaller, yet when you look at the order of magnitude, because epsilon is small, but K is large. And uh, if you look at the order of magnitude, these also come into play. And the other conclusion that comes of this is that for epsilon K order one, the instability spectrum is broadband, unlike PSI. And the reason is, that um, the, the reason is that um, um, when epsilon k is order one, the coupling here, as you can see, is order one. So the modes, all the ends are strongly coupled. Uh, you cannot invoke weak uh, coupling yet. However, um, let's, uh, the, we're going to do one thing at a time. Let's assume first that epsilon k is small. So we are in the PSI regime. Then the, you can solve, as we said, this eigenvalue problem iteratively, and you can find two coupled equations for A naught, uh, which corresponds to omega over two, and A one, which corresponds to om, uh, minus omega over two. These are coupled. Well, first of all, they involve here a group velocity term. Uh, there is here a, a dispersion term, okay? And they're coupled to the underlying flow, here Q, and so on to the other, to the omega minus uh, omega minus omega over two. And similarly, there's another equation for the minus omega over two, which is coupled to the um, or A uh, naught. Now, interestingly, when you do this analysis very carefully, one thing you notice is that even though the coupling is epsilon K, when you include the three halves and the minus three half frequencies, the, the terms that involve the epsilon K disappear so you can see here the coupling is order epsilon actually, and you have this reduced eigenvalue problem. So this is very nice. Uh, of course, the group velocity is one over K because it becomes smaller and smaller as K becomes larger and the uh, dispersion effect even smaller. Now out of this, we can draw some very interesting conclusions. First of all, because epsilon K is much less than one, the one over K term here always wins over the epsilon term here, which is the coupling term and can cause instability. So generally the over one over K group velocity effect dominates the order epsilon interaction that are causing instability. So generally a finite width beam cannot have PSI. All right, we, we conclude that. This was of course also um, concluded by the work with Kari in, in uh, 2014. Um, there are two important exceptions. Uh, and these important exceptions um, involve a scaling of the wave number, which is a, a, a scale wave number kappa divided by square root of epsilon. So that epsilon K is square root of epsilon. And the, these two important exceptions are a nearly monochromatic beam profile. That's the case we, um, we dealt with in uh, 2014. And the other is the group velocity being small here, then this term becomes smaller and can be balanced with the interaction term. And that's the near inertial perturbations that we looked at um, in 2017, okay? So um, in terms of the first conclusion, uh, do the approximate models, how do they compare against, uh, against the the Floquet analysis, the asymptotic and the Floquet, the numerical analysis. 
Well, they do an excellent job. As long as you have to include the contribution of this plus or minus uh, three, over, three omega over two components, um, this play a role particularly for the near inertial PSI because they affect the growth rate. So if you don't include them for the nearly monochromatic, uh, they don't affect the growth rate. So you can get uh, by without including them. It's not absolute, it's not correct really, but it, no problem as far as the growth rates. But for the near inertial PSI, the growth rates are affected by these interestingly. And when you take those into account, uh, you find excellent agreement. So here I'm giving you an example for omega 0 0.1, 0 0.01, and you can see the growth rate uh, as a function of kappa. This is the scaled wave number. Uh, these results are in viscid, and uh, this include the viscosity, and you can see these are numerical results, uh, the, the symbols, and the others are uh, analytical results, and the agreement is, uh, is amazing. Uh, these involve uh, several detunings. These are for near inertial, and these involve several detunings close to the inertial uh, frequency, and the agreement is unbelievably good. So, uh, but you have to include this plus or minus. If you don't, you don't get uh, good agreement. Okay, now uh, coming to the new result, to the really new result, and this is this uh, broadband uh, instability. Uh, there is a, a, a one thing you have to do here, which actually was suggested to us by a referee, uh, which I think I know who the referee is, but I'm not going to mention. Uh, but this was a very kind referee. I don't know if he knew exactly what was going to happen, but anyway, this uh, has a miraculous effect. Well, first of all, uh, it was suggested also by Anu Onuki and Tanaka that this broadening of the spectrum is an advection effect. And therefore, uh, this motivates that uh, to take a frame riding with the wave beam. Remember, the velocity field of the wave beam is the along beam direction, and it's given in terms of the stream function in this way. So if you take this frame C prime, which is the original along beam minus this quantity, remember this is a periodic uh, quantity, this underlying beam. If you make this transformation, then you, you go back to the original equations, the stability equation, then the order epsilon k advection effect is actually factored out that is it disappears from the equations. It's unbelievable. Uh, you would expect, of course, if the underlying wave was constant, but not uh, this periodic and still does. So what this means is that you can do flow k analysis now on this reduced system, on this system where you use this as your along beam coordinate, uh, the underlying beam doesn't depend on C, so you can do that. And uh, the modes now look as before, but when you factor out the along beam uh, dependence in the usual way, this is C prime now. This C prime, when epsilon uh, K is, uh, when epsilon uh, times mu, mu mu is proportional to K. So when epsilon K is order one, this is broadband, because if you write it in terms of, uh, 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 Fourier modes in time, uh, it involves all of them, right? Because this, the exponential, uh, you write it down, you expand it, all of them contribute because this mu times epsilon is no longer small. So this is broadband, and yet you can do, uh, you can do Floquet analysis very nicely, and the coupling terms become order epsilon. So this is miraculous, and it is exact, all right? Now, interestingly, the eigenvalue of problem, of course, can be solved iteratively. And there is a new distinguished limit. This is a new asymptote model, which is broadband, yet can be analyzed uh, in detail asymptotically. And uh, this involves uh, lower viscosity, so higher Reynolds number, and a wave number which scales like one over epsilon. So you have this kappa prime, the scale wave number over epsilon. Remember, in the PSI limit is over square root of epsilon. So the K is smaller, is large, but smaller than in this case. So we're talking a, a nearly inviscid, very short scale perturbations. So what happens in this case, uh, 
you can uh, do a model uh, which is very simple. It's a simplified model similar to the one I showed you earlier, just a couple of uh, couple of equations because all the order epsilon k terms disappear. So you can solve iteratively. And these are some results here for the case um, f equals zero. So this is the case of no rotation. Remember, a Gaussian beam in this case uh, does not develop PSI for f equals zero. If it's finite width, it's a Gaussian beam, not nearly monochromatic. And uh, this shows you uh, the result for this instability. So it plots the, the growth rate here as a function of the scale wave number kappa prime. And you can see the instability bifurcates at an order one kappa prime. So the K is order one or epsilon as uh, indicated by the asymptotics. Uh, the symbols are fully numerical simulation, fully numerical solutions of the flow K analysis. And the, uh, the full line of course is the, is the model. And this for uh, various epsilons, uh, 0 0.01, 0 0.1, even 0 0.2. It does a fantastic job here, uh, not far off. And this is for two, uh, uh, for two frequencies, 0.1 the frequency and 0.8, equally good uh, results. So this is a new result. Uh, this instability um, is not possible with PSI and yet um, it is there and you can see it numerically and you can also capture it analytically in this way. The key result, of course, is this substitution here. This, this is very key. And uh, so this is very important. So uh, uh, I think time-wise, uh, I think I'm doing OK. So it leaves a few minutes for summary and conclusions. Um, I only gave you the gist of it. Uh, it's all described in a paper with uh, Bo Yufan uh, appeared in uh, JFM 2021, all the details there and uh, very big, uh, many results. But let me go through, let me summarize what I talked about today. Uh, we made an asymptotic analysis of the Floquet eigenvalue problem for a small amplitude beam, fine scale perturbation, so K much bigger than one, and high Reynolds numbers. Um, let me here make a little parenthesis uh, that the correct way to think about the stability analysis um, and uh, resonant interactions is the following. It's the Floquet analysis that dictates what interaction you have, not the other way around. That is, it is not correct to say you have a tried interaction and this is the stability. No, it's the Floquet which tells you what are the, tried, the pertinent tried interactions, if there are tried interactions. In this case, um, the assumption of resonant tried is not quite right always. It's okay when epsilon k is small, but you have to take uh, uh, plus or minus three omega over two components. They do contribute to the dominant balance for a B. Uh, so this is important, uh, but it's still narrow band spectrum and the PSI arises only when epsilon K is much less than one. These two specific cases, the near inertial and the nearly monochromatic emerge out of the asymptotic analysis. And the important scaling is that uh, the disturbance wave number is proportional to one over square root of epsilon where epsilon is the amplitude of the beam and the inverse Reynolds number is proportional to epsilon square. Um, now, when you account for these uh, smaller components, you get excellent agreement with the models of um, we did in 2014, 2017, which agree, of course, with the reduced models that, uh, uh, that come from the asymptotic analysis. The new aspect, the completely new aspect, is the possibility of epsilon k order one, uh, where you find the broadband instability, uh, which has different scalings. Uh, it's no longer just a resonant tried interaction for, at all. And then the, the wave number is proportional to one over epsilon and the inverse Reynolds number proportional to epsilon q. So we're talking about much shorter and uh, less viscous or much higher Reynolds number actually, okay? Um, interestingly, for a beam, 
um, this instability is, is very important because it arises in situations where the finite width beam is not susceptible to PSI. For periodic wave, uh, the same thing holds, but for the periodic wave, because the periodic wave has infinite width, the PSI is still there even for F equals zero. So you still get this broad band and it's of course uh, not a PSI, but uh, you still have uh, the, it's not such a dramatic effect. For the beam, it is really uh, much more, uh, much more important. So, uh, um, that's, uh, that's about it. I think I'm doing okay with time and thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to answer in any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Trion Pafilos. Uh, this is a nice piece of work. Uh, thank you very much for this very nice talk. So we learned that you are, you are lucky to have nice referees or at least one nice referee uh, I know, I know, maybe. I know who the referee is. I'm pretty sure, but I'm not going to mention it because I'm not a hundred percent sure. Anyway, <laughs> okay, we don't have. Okay, are there any questions? Oh, yeah, there is a, a question by uh, Yoei Onuki. Do you see in the chat in, in the Fokker analysis? How can one know that n equal to zero or n equal to one correspond to omega over two or omega or minus omega over two respectively? Um, it, it just comes from the, um, you know, you, you, you look at the, um, it, because the first term here, let's, uh, let's go back to this monstrous, uh, you know, here, the first term, for example, is just the linear dispersion relation, more or less. So if you put that, uh, n equals zero or n equals one, um, this term of course has to vanish to lead in order and uh, together with these here and so on, if you, um, if you uh, substitute in. And then you need to satisfy to lead in order the dispersion relation. And that gives you the omega over two and the minus omega over two, because these are the only parts of the Floquet mode which are uh, nearly three modes of the system. The higher, the three omega over two minus three omega over and so on, are forced by the interaction with the beam. So um, that's, how it, uh, that's how it arises, yeah. That's how it arises. It's also kind of obvious from, the, from these numerics here. That is, these are just uh, fully numerical results using the same procedure that you guys or Nuki and Tanaka used uh, with a slight variation, uh, but the same idea, the monodromy approach. And you can see the, the frequency spectrum, the minus omega over two and the plus omega over two and so on. So the analysis, the asymptotic analysis just brings out exactly the same thing. So it's not, uh, it's not surprising. And only these are free modes, nearly free. Uh, these are all forced, the other one. Okay. Thank you, Trian Tapios. Is it okay, Yoe? Maybe you can. Yes, thank you. Uh, Philippe? Yes, uh, I had a question. Uh, I know, Trian Tapios, that you're familiar with our uh, experiments in Lyon, and we have discussed them uh, several times with you. So we, most of the time, we see the triad, the resonant triad interaction. Though, does this mean in, in the in the framework of your analysis that we are usually in the case epsilon k not small compared to one because our amplitude are large enough? Uh, well, first of all, in your case, the viscosity, the viscosity is very, very big. So the, the high Reynolds number constraint is not satisfied. Uh, okay. So that plays, uh, that plays big, big role here. Uh, the analysis is nearly invasive. So that I think is the main constraint, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we would not be able to see your uh, broadband instability no, because no. of viscosity. Yeah, yeah. Okay, thank but you. The, in ocean, uh, we have some numbers in the paper with uh, Boyu, I didn't write them down. The broadband seems to be quite relevant for the ocean where the Reynolds numbers are pretty high. So uh, yeah, yeah. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you, Philippe. Mani, do you have a question? What's written in the chat is not completely clear to me. No? Sorry, can you hear me, Thierry? Yes, perfect. Go ahead, uh, Mani. Sorry, some autocorrect uh, sent some message in Tamil. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so, Triantapilos, uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, I was just wondering the limit of infinite width for the wave beam is a plane wave. Can you comment a little on the limit of uh, zero width? Uh, the you mean the going from the beam to the uh, from the beam to the infinite uh, wave to yeah. the periodic wave is that what you're asking from the beam to infinitesimally small width or infinitely small width yeah uh, then you wouldn't have I mean you're looking at uh, um, I mean the k is uh, the uh, the yeah. Um, I have to look at the, the the length scale which is used here to normalize uh, lengths is the width of the b. So if you uh, and that's how it measures k. K is. Uh, is scaled with one over the width of the beam, yeah? So the theory assumes that the wave numbers are much, so the wavelengths of the perturbations are much, much shorter than the width of the beam. Uh, so the theory really doesn't apply to your case. That is, if you assume now the width of the beam becomes very small, you're violating that. So you're, you're, it just doesn't apply. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, is there any other, any other question? No question, so thank you very much, uh, Triantafilos.